so which is going not surprising going to talk about learning okay <laughs> but quantum systems so please so i hope you can hear me now okay thanks anna for the introduction yeah uh, first of all i want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, beautiful place i'm i'm really enjoying um, this conference a lot because uh, okay, my title, I, I tried to connect my title, so to say, to the conference, so it has quantum in it, it has learning in it. Um, I mean, I'm an experimentalist coming from Vienna now, and first of all, I mean, I cannot do machine learning in a way because I'm not used to using a computer. I like to use uh, little um, quantum systems that we built in the lab. But in the, in the recent time, we were thinking a lot about like how to use maybe machine learning and how to maybe learn more about quantum systems, yeah? And so this is a bit the story that I want to tell you here today. So um, I, and I picked out two learning tasks. I mean, we are learning every day in the lab a lot, but you know, like two specific learning tasks I took out here. The first one is a bit more on the experimental slash technical side. It will be about like how we build a little physics inspired model to produce optimal optical potentials with the help of a digital micro mirror device. Very much in the spirit of what Julian was talking about two days ago, like to imprint optical potentials to clouds of ultra cold atoms. And the other learning task will be about um, more on the quantum simulation side. So I, will, I want to show you a very recent project of ours where we thought of like doing Hamiltonian learning. So we heard this term also. Um, a lot this week already, but I think I might give you another spirit onto that because um, I want to show you how you can learn effective field theories from measurement data in your lab. Okay, so we're asking the question, what is an effective Hamiltonian describing this system? Okay, but let me start uh, with the first part. Okay, for this I will introduce to you our experimental platform that we have in our laboratories in Vienna. So what we are using is a so-called atom chip. This is basically a microfabricated structure um, through which we can send currents, uh, oscillating or uh, DC currents basically, to create magnetic fields. And with the help of these magnetic fields, we can trap ultra-cold rubidium atoms below the surface of this chip. And our specialty, so to say, is to generate two thin, let's say, call them quantum wires. So basically we are creating um, two one-dimensional Bose-Einstein condensates of rubidium-87 below that atom chip um, where you can uh, explore the physics that's coming from the on-site interaction, so the atoms are interacting repulsively with each other, and the tunneling between the two wires. Yeah? And so how you can think of this is basically what you have. You have two Bose-Einstein, so quasi-Bose-Einstein condensates because we are in 1D, so there is no strict condensation, so to say which we want to describe in terms of the relative degrees of freedom. So I already told you we have some tunneling going on that couples basically the, the two wires which each other. So you want, so what we are interested in is the relative degrees of freedom, so the relative density fluctuations, what we call pi, and the relative phase fluctuations, which we call phi. Yeah, and later in my talk, I will talk a bit more about the physics and how we can deduce the effective physics describing the systems. But what is now relevant is that like, um, usually creating these systems here below the atom chip, what happens in this long, in this longitudinal direction, in the 1D direction is that we create trapping potentials which look like that. That's something you have often in, in a lab if you create a trapping potential. Is it from magnetic field or an optical dipole beam? what you have is you have harmonic trapping confinement. And this is, in a way, not what you want because these systems then feature um, spatially dependent atomic density and this leads to spatially dependent interaction and so on. So what you, what you would like to have is, for example, a flat box potential or at least you want to have control over the trapping configuration in this longitudinal direction. So what we what we uh, set out to do, and we were not the first to do so. There's many, la many people doing this uh, for, for lattice systems as well as continuous, continuous systems as we have them in the lab. Is, so basically what you do, you have your, you have your sorry, okay. Um, 
ah, here. You have your cloud of ultra cold atoms, and what you can do additionally to the magnetic fields, you can shine in basically light fields from the side, and with this create optical dipole potentials to compensate for the harmonic confinement. And this was the setup we came up with. So what we have is we have a digital micro mirror device. So this is basically a pixelated like matrix of small mirrors that you can switch in an off or an on position. And with this, you can create basically arbitrary light patterns by shining a, a light source, for example, a laser, or here in this case, as an SLED onto that thing. And then what you do is you image the light that you create, basically the light pattern that you create in the plane of the DMD. You image with some lenses, does not, does not matter the details for you now here, uh, onto like the atoms, or like in our case here, this was a test setup, onto a CCD camera, okay? And then maybe you also want to do something like an optimal control on, of your pattern, so you want to give some feedback and modify the DMD pattern to create some optimal optical potentials. And just that you see that we can do re like really what we want, so this is one of the patterns that we created, so this is the logo of our home university, so this is always a bit self-advertisement here, yeah, so you can see we can do really arbitrary patterns. Okay, so, but now, question. You told us we, you can do everything, but why do you want to do machine learning? Okay, or why are you doing machine learning? So, okay, what you usually have, you have some input, this is in this case a pattern that we put onto the DMD. Then you, have this, then you have a system which basically processes this input. And in our case, this is for example, the optics that we use to image the DMD pattern onto the atoms. And then what you get, you get some output and this you can compare to some target. For example, what you want is you want to have a flat, fl flat box trapping potential. However, Unfortunately, world is not perfect. I mean, most likely this is a good thing that world is not perfect, but okay, here in that case it's a bad thing because we, you don't end up with a box, but you have some residual like problems, so to say. So what you want to do, you want to calculate the error between what you get out and the target, and you want to do some feedback. Yeah, so however, in our case, what we wanted to have is we wanted to have a trained model representing the system, including all its imperfections. Why do we want to have this? Because our experimental system is usually slow. So our machine gets like a picture or like a realization of the quantum simulation, so to say, every 30 seconds. So this means optimizing that thing over hundreds of iterations takes a lot of time. Yeah, and you would like to spare this time because if you can spare the time of optimizing an optical potential, you can do some very interesting quantum simulation in the same time. So that's why we were aiming for a model to do this optimization of, the, of, this, uh, of this optical potential, so to say, offline, so without using the actual system. Yeah, and so now basically we ask the question, how can we generate an experimentally efficiently trainable machine learning model? Yeah. And this is what we in the end called physics-inspired learning model, which is a quite fancy term for something very simple, but you will see it in the next slide, okay? So, in a way, what did we do? So we thought of what is happening in the system, yeah, and what is happening? So you have a 1D virtual input, in our case 1D is enough because you have a 1D system, and you, you will get some optical potentials as an output, yeah? And now the question is how do you set up the model in between? So what we first thought of, okay, let's put a layer which basically represents the shape of our beam. So we don't put already a homogeneous light beam onto the DMD, but this already has some shape. Secondly, there is some imaging going on, and this imaging has a finite resolution, so we can include basically a point spread function. So this is basically like giving the resolution of the, the optical system, and there can be some offsets to, to the camera, to do the measurement, to do something else, to some noise basically. And there's actually some additional noise appearing here as well, I see it. Okay, and then we added one polynomial nonlinear layer to include basically everything else, but also the mapping from these 2D pictures that we have on the DMD uh, to the virt 1D virtual input. And with this, we basically set up our very simple physics-inspired model that, that should mimic basically our optical setup that we were using. And then what we did is we trained this model basically by, by really, I mean, there we had to use the actual setup, but we could, we could use that. And so this was 
like a test setup basically with light. So we trained the model basically using uh, several patterns onto the DMD and then look like observing the output. Yeah, so we could train this machine learning model. And then we could go to the experimental optimization. Yeah, and for this optimization, just like maybe for the experts or if you're interested in this, for, for giving the feedback, we used an algorithm which, was, which is called iterative learning control. I won't go into detail. I'll give you a citation on the next slide. And if you're interested in that, we can talk um, afterwards about this. So what, did we, so what we, did we do? So you have some initial guess. So this is how the optimization works. Basically, in the end, uh, you have some initial guess. You, feed, you generate a 1D virtual input. You feed it into your machine learning model. You get some predicted optical output compare it to your target potential, calculate the error, put it in this black box, which is the iterative learning control, and you update the virtual input. And this you do as long, like many iterations, such that you are happy with the result, okay? And this is what we call offline closed loop optimization, so to say, yeah? We can now do a closed loop optimization, but we can do the whole thing offline, so without using our experimental system. So the experimental system can do something else, some interesting quantum simulation that we already prepared, yeah? But we can do, in principle, the whole thing as well with the system, yeah? We can also use, basically, the system itself, so do the optimization offline, okay? So this was basically the idea, and the idea of that, so this is, this is basically um, summed up as well, the model as well, the results, experimental side is summed up in this paper here, and if you want to know more about the iterative, iterative learning control, this is something which we got from our friends from the Automation and Control Institute, so really people coming really from the control side were included in this, is this you can find some details in this paper. So what were the results? Um, the results were the following. So this is are the, like some examples of an optical potential where we optimized basically for some flat optical potential here in this regime. And what you see on the right side yeah, is basically the error, the root mean square error in percent as a function of the number of iterations. Okay, so you do this optimization several times. So what the constant, or what is it, purple line here at 10%, this is the result we get from the offline optimization. Yeah, so this is constant because it has no it, number of iterations using the system, so to say. Yeah, so this is just done with our physics-inspired model. So this is basically the level we can get without using the system after training the model. And then what we compare to, this is the green line, this is what we call a heuristic algorithm. Algorithm. This is already used uh, in another experiment in Vienna. Yeah, it was basically our, our baseline. This was used so far as uh, for optimizing these potentials. And what you can see is that like we can get to uh, the same accuracy basically with our physics inspired model. So without using the experiment, um, so for which the, the heuristic algorithm would need something like 75 shots using the experiment. So we could already, just comparing to this one, spare a lot, a lot, a lot of shots basically on the, on the true physical machine, yeah? So we, we already gained some, some big advantage here. And on the other side, what you see is our, our, um, also our feedback mechanism is, works quite well. So the red line is basically just using the online. Okay, you use the online optimization, but now with the iterative learning control, which was also not used before. And then you see you, you need something like 10 shots or so to come already to this level, which is the final level that we can achieve, basically. Yeah? And then in the end, what we plan to do is now basically to basically something like a pre-optimization offline, and then just do a few steps online using the machine. So basically, just do the final fine tuning basically online. Yeah? This is what we envisioned. So this was basically my first example of like how we used machine learning or like a little learning model basically inspired by machine learning to, to optimize processes in preparing a quantum simulator. Yeah? And as I said, this, this work is basically this is summarized in this publication. I just want to acknowledge already the people here because the people in the second project will be a bit different people. So, so this was basically the project led from the PhD side, basically by Martino Kalsavara and by Yevgeny Kuryatnikov. So, and we worked together with the group of Andreas Deutschmann and Andreas Kugi in, in Vienna and uh, Thomas Okalako and Felix Mozzo in Jülich. Okay, good. So, um, is there some questions so far to this part? Because if not, I would 
switch a little bit gears. Yeah, Christoph. Yeah, so I mean, this is something, yeah, this is a, obviously a question from an experimentalist, but this is something which I think will, um, I mean, so to say in all its details only come up when we use it like for a long time on the experiment. What we saw on the, on the test setup so far is that it's, it's rather stable actually, and concerning interferences and so on, you mean like some, some random speckles and so? That's why, I mean, I had this, I, I just flashed this shortly. We were also testing out actually here using an incoherent light source, not a laser. And we saw that this gives us definitely a big enhancement. So in terms of trainability, let's say, of the model, I mean, I don't want to, use, no, let me no, not use this word trainability and not, all, not that all the machine learning people like will fight me in the end. Let's say in terms of, like how well we can do the offline optimization using the incoherent light source works much better. But if you have access to the online optimization, the iterative learning control as a feedback mechanism works equally well for the laser as well as for the incoherent light source. This is what I can say so far. Okay, good. Then, um, let me come to my um, second topic. And this is now regarding like doing Hamiltonian learning for effective field theories. So what do I mean with that? I, I should give you a little introduction. So what we are interested in in our, let's say, physics endeavors, not that this was not physics, but like, you know, like what we usually do in our laboratories is quantum many body systems. So we are interested in systems um, like these. Yeah, so you have, ma you have many particles in a system which are close to each other, hopefully interacting with each other, which have, might have some internal degrees of freedom, like here a spin, or you know, like they can tunnel, as I already described it to you. And they are, their, their properties are basically quanta, qu uh, governed by quantum mechanical effects, okay? And we already saw basically uh, beautiful experiments, for example, again, by, for example, in Julian's talk, where um, basically this, this, whole, this whole field has grown studying these systems really in a microscopic fashion. So you do basically really like a bottom-up approach by assembling these systems in a microscopic fashion, particle by particle, on lattice side by lattice side, controlling interaction, controlling position. We, we rather take a, so to say, a contrary approach coming from the big systems and understanding more and more um, by looking at those systems in a bit of like a zoomed out view, okay? So we want to look at the large scale, low energy effective physics basically of these systems. And then what might happen actually is that there might be new emergent degrees of freedom on these long wavelength scales. And okay, surprisingly here in this example, out of these like many little spins, there were emerging basically big spins, yeah? And, and we are interested basically into, in, in the physics of these like uh, spins or like systems of degrees of freedom emerging on the long, uh, low energy scale or on the long wavelength, yeah? So, and so what we, how we call this is basically, we call this like quantum fields. So we, we seek descriptions uh, of these emergent degrees of freedom by effective field theories, yeah? So the effective interaction constants should be captured by these effective field theories. And now what we wanted to ask is, can we learn the effective Hamiltonian, so like the effective field theory Hamiltonian, describing these physics from our experimental measurements? Yeah. And so for quantum fields, there were already basically investigations in these directions. Um, this was basically approaches using the equal time effective action. Okay, now you might wonder, who? what is the equal time effective action? Never heard of this. Yeah, this um, was the same for us because we were also not like trained that well in quantum field theory. So the quantum field theorists be, um, in the audience might know, but the others might not. Um, but we, we managed basically to measure like the equal time effective action in these like field theory systems. This is a paper which was already cited this week. And 
but we were all trained a little bit more in the language of Hamiltonians, yeah? So we wanted to learn effective Hamiltonians because this is somewhat more intuitive for us to, uh, because we can interpret what is happening in a Hamiltonian. And so we took basically inspiration by, by many, many papers, and I cannot cite all of them, who do Hamiltonian learning for microscopic theories. Yeah? But we wanted to basically translate those ideas to the realm of like effective field theories. So what is the workflow? Okay, so let me, let me guide you through this like very complicated slide, but I, I hope um, you will get the ideas afterwards. So if you think of like Hamiltonian learning, what you want to do is you want to formulate an Ansatz Hamiltonian yeah, in terms of interaction terms, in terms of interaction constants. But the question you have to ask is, what are the entities or what are the operators I put into my Hamiltonian? Yeah? And for spins, for example, sitting on a lattice, it's quite clear. You put the spin operators on the different lattice sites and then you can think of like, I have maybe a ZZ interaction, I have a XZ interaction, I have a field in X direction, okay? So it's quite clear in which terms you should formulate your Hamiltonian. However, what we do here is we prepare systems of ultra cold atoms which are like, microscopically these are like atoms which sit on certain positions and interact with each other. But what we are measuring is always a coarse grained picture, yeah? So we get some coarse grained field like of thing which lives on a, on a certain length scale, basically, okay? So, and this is why you have to think about like, what are basically the, the coarse grained fields I have to put into my effective Hamiltonian. And how this works is the following. So what you do is, on the theory side, so to say, you formulate an Ansatz Hamiltonian, yeah? and this might depend on some masses, some interaction scales, yeah? And then what you do is you have to basically coarse grain this Ansatz Hamiltonian. So what you do is you basically write down the, uh, the generating functionals of all your like, <laughs> uh, correlation functions and you basically integrate out high energy modes up to the scale where you will measure. Yeah? And this will lead to basically a flow of this Hamiltonian in this like coupling space basically. Okay? So the coarse graining brings you basically to some scale A on which the new Hamiltonian will live, okay? And then you will get some effective Hamiltonian describing the physics at the scale A, okay? And the second line that you see flowing in here, the gray one, this is basically describing the system, the true system, because basically your system Hamiltonian that you will learn later and the microscopic Hamiltonian that you write down in your field theory ansatz, they do not have to coincide. Because for us, in our example, to get very explicit, it's atoms, interacting via delta potential interaction and tunneling between two wells. And later we will describe it by a sine gordon field theory. Yeah? And this will only match on a certain scale. But microscopically, they are definitely not the same. Yeah? So you have to basically translate your microscopic ansatz onto the right scale. Yeah? And then what you do on the other side is you perform your quantum simulation experiment. So you have your experiment. Yeah? And then you have to, you, you prepare some interesting quantum state. In our case, for example, here, you prepare a thermal state of a certain system Hamiltonian. And then you do coarse grained measurements and you basically store the results. So here in this case, this is the field value phi as a function of the position x for every pixel that you have, for example, on your camera, okay? And you take many snapshots of those systems and you store the data um, on your computer, and from this you can calculate basically any type of correlation function that you can imagine having these fields, okay? And now, everything now, everything else you have to do. So what, what did we do? Just to summarize maybe shortly, what did we do? We formulated an Ansatz Hamiltonian. We just, under, just, I mean, I did not do this. This is the field theorist's work, but we, they basically integrated out the, the high energy so to say scales, this is something they can do perturbatively, so analytically, so no basically solving here involved of any theory, yeah? no numerics, nothing. And on the other side, we performed our quantum simulation and basically calculated these correlation functions. And all the rest we have to do is we have to do classical post-processing. Yeah? So from calculating basically um, 
uh, um, basically uh, commutators between the Hamiltonian and certain observables, just like calculating on a, on a field level, so to say, yeah? not, not calculating the expectation values, we can get constraints on these correlation functions. Yeah? And these constraints allow us basically to deduce the interaction constants. Okay? So you see, here's, I hope you see, <laughs> here's no numerical or analytical solving of the whole theory involved. Everything we have to do is we have to formulate an ansatz Hamiltonian and do the measurements on the system. This means we can do this whole procedure also in regimes where we do not have, can, where we cannot solve basically our ansatz Hamiltonian so to say, yeah? So it's not a fitting of somewhat generated uh, computer data, but it's really um, deducing the Hamiltonian parameters in that way without being able to solve the theory, okay? It's just that we have constraints that we can deduce from the ansatz Hamiltonian, okay? So now that the confusion is uh, finally arri has arrived, let's get a bit more explicit. So in our case, as I already described, basically at the, at the really low momentum scale, or like high energy scales, basically, or like at microscopic uh, distances, uh, our system will be described by a Bose gas. So these are bosonic atoms interacting with each other. However, what, what was already found in other studies, that, or like you can also show, basically that on large, the, the large wavelength physics basically can be dis effectively described by a sine gordon field theory. So what we did is we basically formulated the sine gordon field theory, a microscopic sine gordon field theory, and then basically calculated the effective Hamiltonian on the scale on which we can do the measurement and the experiment. Okay, so on the other side, you perform your experiment. We do basically here uh, interference measurements. Details do not matter so much at the moment, yeah, with a certain scale A and calculate the correlation functions. And by mapping the correlation functions to the constraints, we can learn this effective sine gordon Hamiltonian. Okay, this is basically the workflow that we were performing. Okay, so what did we do? Um, so far, the, the results I will show you today are actually, um, are actually obtained using <laughs> some numerical simulations. I mean, I, I said we, we don't need numerical simulations, but so far, um, we, we tested basically this procedure on numerical simulations on the sine gordon field theory in a, certain, in a certain limit because this was much cleaner, so to say, than the experiment, even though I'm the experimentalist. Okay, so what, what are you doing? What do you do? You basically want to learn the Hamiltonian, and now what we wanted to look at is what is the Hamiltonian as a function of measurement scale? Yeah, so you do some numerical simulation. This numerical simulation has some lattice scale, A, U, V, and now you do a coarse graining, basically, of your results. And as a function of the coarse graining, we do, basically, the Hamiltonian learning, okay? And this is, these are the results. So in the upper plot, what you see are the, the learned couplings of, of our effective field theory and they are normalized to the values that we know, because now it's numeric, so we know the values, so we can basically uh, normalize to our expectation. And in the lower graph, what you see, this is what we call reduced chi-squared. This is basically telling us how well did this like variational finding of the optimal parameters work, okay? And this, and both these quantities we plot as a function of the pixel size, so basically of the, of the coarse graining size. So what you see is, um, starting from a certain scale, which is like on the order of twice or three times, or like, ah, no, it's actually eight times, the, so to say this AUV, sorry for this like different notations here, yeah, suddenly our field theory learning works because like below that scale, what you see is basically lattice effects, yeah? You see that this was done numerically on a lattice, but the field theory description basically works starting from a certain scale, so you see because like chi squared is basically equal to one, yeah? And what you see is that like the learned couplings coincide with the exact couplings that we put in. This works until basically here. So here, here still chi squared is um, in the, within the error bar equal to one. But what you see on, uh, on, the, on the higher part here basically is that the learned couplings do not coincide anymore 
with the exact couplings that we put in. But the coupling is basically flowing with length scale, which is somewhat reminiscent of like a flowing coupling if you do a renormalization group analysis of a field theory. So it, there's more details to that and also a bit of analytics con concerning this in the, in the paper that I will should, like cite you later. So, but you see, we now have a method basically with which we can deduce something like a flow of uh, interaction constants as a function of the length scale that we are looking on it. And so we can basically study this RG type of flow, basically, of the, of the interaction constants in our system. Yeah, and then you see, if you go to longer scales, okay, certainly it does not work anymore. But at some point, if the, if the coarse graining scale comes on the scale of your physics, okay, if you wash out everything with your coarse graining, that, that maybe the, the description does not work anymore, I think is also sensible. Okay. Uh, let's, but now, okay, now what we did is we took an Ansatz Hamiltonian um, from which we knew it should work <laughs> and we basically found it works and we analyzed the couplings. But it was already discussed this morning, I think, that like maybe sometimes you also want to put your Ansatz as in terms of like what operators should I put, yeah? And this, in, in some discussion this was coined like a discovery mode of our, of our methods, so to say, yeah? So what do we do? We basically, we write down an Ansatz. Okay, so this, the details, so to say, do not matter. But in a way, what we do is we write down an Ansatz and here the interaction potential V, we now basically test different interaction potentials V. Yeah, and we see how well does the, word, the learning work, okay? So what you see here is basically this reduced chi squared again as a fun, not as a function, but like for different interaction potentials V, okay? And the sine Gordon theory, which I did used before for doing the learning, is basically the cosine phi here. And for us, so to say, the most relevant to compare is actually the phi squared, because phi squared would be basically a simple non-interacting theory. It would be just like Gaussian theory. And this is something you want to exclude if you want to uh, uh, call your system maybe strongly correlated, for example. Yeah? So what you see here is you, you will see soon three types of markers. And these markers are basically for different regimes. It has a bit to, be, to do with, with like coupling strength and temperature. It does not matter so much. But what you see is like for the two white markers basically, for these two parameters, the learning also works for only using a phi squared potential. So this data is basically consistent with using a Hamiltonian which just has quadratic, so no interaction, just a massful theory. However, for Q is equal to 3.2, this does not work at all. Yeah, so we basically saw that like this, this, this data here is not consistent with using a quadratic theory. Yeah, however, if we use the cosine, I mean the cosine always includes the phi squared, so to say. So you will get a fitting here as well. However, this this data can all also rep be represented by the using the cosine <coughs> potential. Yeah, and then you see, okay, it, it depends for the for the different potentials. So you see that like the, the basically the periodicity does not fit here very well, so you get like a better fitting, but not still good, yeah? Okay, and then we can, we can do this a bit more systematically, so now what you see is the reduced chi squared as a function of this coupling, coupling ratio Q, and you see for the blue markers, this is again the phi, uh, phi to the two, basically phi squared theory that we used, you see that there is a whole region where basically the fitting does not work, but for the red blot, the red blot markers, so the cosine theory, it works everywhere. And actually, the region that we marked here in gray is not marked by us, by hand, so to say, but in gray color, what you see is the magnitude of fourth order connected correlation functions. So a measure for basically having a non-Gaussian state. And you see that this very nicely coincides with the region where the learning with the phi squared potential does not work anymore. This was very, so to say, satisfying for us to see. This was like, we were very happy to see that. Okay, good. Um, basically, this was um, the results I, I wanted to show you uh, concerning this part. Yeah. Because, uh, so in, in the paper there is much more, but I think this is, this is basically, I, I think you got now, you got now the, right, the right flavor. Unfortunately, uh, so we also did this with some experimental data and it works. However, we are still a bit limited 
by resolution. Resolu so we are more on the, on the right side of the first plot. Yeah? So it works, but uh, higher resolution would certainly be nice and higher statistics as well, but we are working on that. And the other thing is, uh, also the numerical data I showed you so far was all in a regime where classical statistical description um, is still working. So it was rather, rather effective field theory learning than effective quantum field theory learning, okay? Um, but we are working currently on the experiment uh, on methods also to bring these systems in a regime where quantum fluctuations actually might play a role. And the, the biggest killer, so to say, is temperature. So to, at which temperature can you prepare those systems in a thermal-like state? And for this I want to just, so this is just a, a short teaser and just short advertisement and just like something to think about for the last two minutes. Okay, so how can we go more quantum or how can we go towards quantum states or how can we create like lower temperature states? So what we have, as I said, is we have two tunnel coupled basically wells, yeah? with a tunnel coupling J and on-site interaction. So how do, you, how do you create those systems in a thermal state? How it was done basically, let's say historically or still done, but this is a very efficient way is, what you do is you prepare a thermal gas in a single well, yeah? and now you split this thermal gas into a double well system already. Yeah? This we can do with, high, with a high level of control. And then you cool down by evaporative cooling, yeah? so you blow away the hottest atoms and you cool down in the Bose-Einstein condensate state basically, and then what happens is you will get basically a thermal state in this double well where the temperature of this relative degree of freedom is basically governed by the temperature of the, of the density degree of freedom, so of the sum degree of freedom, okay? This is nice, this works very efficiently, you get very nicely thermal states, however, the temperature of this some degree of freedom of the density is quite high. And this is the limitation I presented to you. Another way of preparing the systems, this could lead actually to, to new regimes or to like colder, effectively colder systems. So what you do here is you prepare the thermal gas again in the single well, and then you cool it down in the single well to the Bose-Einstein condensate BC state, and then you do a slow splitting. Okay, if you are, so to say, coming from the business of squeezing and entanglement in atomic uh, condensates, this was basically already the, you know, this was already basically the technique used by Markus Obertaler 2008 to create spin squeezing in a, in a multi-well potential of uh, atomic BCs. Yeah, but there it was really like single mode BCs, like just in the double well. But, but here we are using this technique basically now for our 1D coupled wires, yeah? And this, because like you know, like basically you can see that like the, the ground state of this with repulsive interaction and finite tunneling coupling will feature some number and spin squeezing, so it can feature entanglement. And actually it was shown that like this entanglement or like every, every amount of spin squeezing will directly translate of, of a low, into a lower effective temperature in a pre-thermalized state. And these were now many buzzwords, but if you're interested into it, um, you can either read this publication, which, which just appeared in PRX, or you can just come to me after the talk, and I'm happy to also tell you some more details what we actually really did in this paper. Yeah? Okay, so with this, um, let me also acknowledge the people in, involved in this work. So, as I said, the hard work, in, in a way, the, the calculations, so the RG stuff and so on was not done by me, but was done by Rob, for, like first mostly of by Robert Ott and Thorsten Sache, and this was basically a big collaboration with Hannes Pichler and Peter Zoller, and from the Vienna side with Amin, Sebastian Erne, and, and Jörg Schmidmeier. And the other people on the on the right side are basically people doing the work uh, in the in the laboratory as well from the from the last project I showed you. And if you're interested in what we, what we plan also in the future to do, Venkat is here, he had a poster yesterday, he's also happy to talk about that. Okay, with this, let me summarize. Uh, the first learning task I showed you was concerned with like, how can we create um, with basically feedback control optimal, opti op optimal optical potentials, that's always not so easy. Um, and the second part was concerned with doing Hamiltonian learning for quantum field theories. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention.
the conformal field theory, hui. Now you, what do you mean with that, sorry? Um, well, if I do a quantum field theory, I can always find an effect in the conformal field theory. I have my idea. Yeah. No, no, I don't, I, I, I mean, I, I, th I think I roughly get what you mean, but no, we are really looking, you know, for an effective description of our system <coughs> and we really are after the um, after just the effective description. But for instance, all these kinds of uh, border, so you have this border, this two quantity border, and then you look at this effective and you find that it's kind of order because they are bosons and so on. And but can you find in other parameters with the same kind as yeah. border? Huh. Yeah, so this is actually, I think, I think this is concerning Klein-Gordon, for example. This is effectively what I show you here. Okay. I mean, or like basically on that slide, you know, as a function of Q. So, okay, I, I will start a bit slower. So if you, if, <laughs> if you write down the microscopic Hamiltonian, basically, of two Bose gases in a, t in a, in a double well, okay, and then... This was basically a paper by Polkovnikov, Demler, and Kritzev in like 2008. Then you can show under some approximation in some second order perturbation, basically neglecting some terms, blah, blah, blah. You can show that this system maps onto St. Gordon. Yeah? But at this point, it was not at all clear if all these approximations hold and in which, re it's with, in which regimes it's clear. And so all the works that were done before were basically surprising in that respect that it works over such a large area. And what I show you here basically is here that like true sine Gordon, so to say, with the cosine potential is only needed here where you have the gray area. Okay. Otherwise, it's either a massful theory with just a phi squared or it's, you know, it's, yeah. yeah. Um, use these things to find or to measure fundamental constants. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no. These things, let's talk about these things. So, no, it's very nice, but. So you mean like of QCD also? Yeah. Naya, no. If, no, I don't, yeah, I mean like if, okay, let me put it like this. If someone in that, if, um, if, if someone has an experiment that can access scales where QCD is, the, is a good effective theory, yeah, so I mean that I say these are bosons which live at a certain position in space is also just true until a certain scale. At some point, QCD might be the right theory. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so if someone has an experiment working on the, on the right scale and can measure the, the, the relevant correlation functions describing basically the fields appearing in the, in the Hamiltonian, then maybe you can use it, yeah. But I think they have better methods most likely uh, in, the, in the QCD regime, yeah. No, no, no worries. More questions. For me, it was not very clear. So, how you do this coarse graining, uh, different scales of the correlations? Uh? Ah, yeah. Okay, this is this is okay. This is very this is so. In the experiment, let me say, let me start with the experiment. There, it's like supernatural. I mean, if you do a, if you do microscopy, the size of the lens and the focal length of your lens defines some some resolution limit. Okay, so there, and then you have a camera with which you record, and this has a pixel size. So this very naturally gives you a coarse graining of what is happening, right? And in the numerics, it's just, I mean, the numerics is calculated on, on a certain lattice, and then we binarized it new, basically. We, we introduced new pixels, or you smooth it out with a Gaussian kernel that you just, like, you know, like, uh, convoluted. And then this gives you a new scale. Yeah. Which, uh, how many or correlations then you need? Ah, or, mm -hmm. or yeah, this is the, ones? yeah, super, thanks. This is a, I mean, it's a very subtle, but uh, very good question. So, okay, I, I mean, I, I did not go in too much detail how, how, we, how, how we anyway get the constraints. So what you do is the following. You take your ansatz Hamiltonian, you promote it on that scale, uh, A, where you work, and now the question is how, get, how do you get constraints on your correlation functions? So what you do is you take your ansatz Hamiltonian, 
and then you calculate the commutator of this thing with some observable, okay? And the expectation value of this, you know is zero, because I said we are in a thermal state. And you know, a commutator of H with any observable is zero because this is time, time, time evolution, basically. So, and what this, I mean, maybe, I, so what this is basically, what, what H commutator with some observable gives you is a, basically a sum of some correlation functions now again, which are weighted somewhat by the interaction constants. So by just using one of these observables, you get, will get a sum of correlation functions. Um, and these you have to measure, okay? Now you can ask what's ob what observables should I use? Yeah, best you use, for example, first, <laughs> which are basically compatible with the symmetries that you write into your Hamiltonian. Otherwise, these are non-trivial zeros, <laughs> basically. But how many you should use, I cannot give you a recipe in, in general. So you should use different ones, and so that you basically, I think, sample well enough, like the terms, so to say, that you also have in your Hamiltonian. So you should also have some high, so I don't think you should use things that only give you second order correlation functions, because if you have interaction terms in your Hamiltonian, then you should also sample higher ones. But I mean, we write this also explicitly in the paper. There are some guiding principles that you can follow, but I cannot prove you what you should use. So you should basically use different types of correlation functions. Um, so far, what I showed you here is only using this phi, right? I told you there's the relative phase and there's also the relative atom number. In the classical statistical regime that we were in, those two factorized basically, because you have only pi squared and the rest, so to say. However, if you go eventually in a, in a quantum regime, yeah, then you will all, then they do not factorize anymore. So you will also have to measure correlations of pi, and you will have to measure correlations of pi and phase. Yeah, and there are methods for the covariance matrix for this system already, but we are also, I could not show because of time, but we are also working on methods how to measure uh, general correlation functions of pi and phi in the experiment by using some generalized POVM type of measurements, basically. So by measuring both in the same experimental realization. I hope this... No, we do some type of heterodyning, I would say. Let's put it like this. So you really can measure both quadratures, X and P, in the same experimental realization. Yeah. You will get in some noise from the heterodyne measurements, so to say, but you can measure them both as a function, and then you can do really all the correlation functions up to any order. Okay, I might ask uh, a, a follow-up question to this. So now, now, now we understood a bit better uh, how all of this works. At, at first it was a bit obscure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but so, um, in, case, in case you want to prepare then a state which is, which is not a thermal state, uh -huh. uh, as you've as you shown at the end, yeah. uh, then this post-processing needs to be really modified, right? Thanks. You, you, I mean, thanks to all the questions, you're basically asking all the rest that I did not show. So, um, so we stole basically one of the techniques that were already there for Hamiltonian learning. This is for a thermal or like a, basically a, a steady state you can use that the commutator is zero. But you can also do quenches. So you can also go, you can prepare a state, do a quench, and what you then use is basically energy conservation. So energy conservation also gives you constraints on your correlation functions because it tells you what you have to do then is you have to basically measure the energy, so measure the Hamiltonian yeah, in every time step, and you know that the right Hamiltonian gives you conserved energy. So and actually there are new subtleties coming in for the field theory because suddenly what happens if energy is not conserved because excitations flow into a regime that you cannot measure. Yeah, microscopically it's clear energy is conserved, but here even though energy is conserved, it could be that like your field theory Hamiltonian shows you that energy is not conserved because excitations are flowing into a regime that you cannot observe. And then you would need new types of descriptions in terms of open systems or whatever. Um, or like, if someone has a good idea what type of description you need, I'm super happy to talk about this. I, I find this super interesting, but I, I mean, I'm an experimentalist, uh, just thinking about these things. So yeah, super, thanks for the question. But you can adapt those. We actually, we have in the paper, we have actually also um, 
some analytics concerning quench data. Thanks Describe a lot. Describe how it works. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question.